Hey, good morning. Hey, if you're new, I'm Charlie, the lead pastor here. Man, we're really glad that you are um, worshiping with us today. Uh, like I said, we're wrapping up our um, our Christmas series and uh, today, and um, kind of give you guys a little insight, kind of how, how things work. So this, you know, some probably late summer, Mark and I are getting together, and we're kind of trying to plan out the the whole fall, kind of what our different sermon series are going to be, and so we need, we're going to do an Old Testament character, which we do just about every fall, so we picked we picked Abraham and kind of walking through what different stories we were. And then there's one story that where, you know, where Abraham uh, is asked by God to, to sacrifice his son. And then he, uh, God ultimately says he doesn't have to, right, when Abraham's about to. And he's like, man, since you have not withheld your one and only son from me, I'm going to do even more for you, which is obviously a foreshadowing. It's a foreshadowing of God doing the very same thing, sacrificing his own son. And as we were kind of talking about that, I was like, "Wait, wait! That that could be a really good that could be a really good Christmas series to kind of look at different stories um, in the in the Old Testament that kind of foreshadow uh, the coming of Jesus. That would be a great deal." So we start brainstorming about that, kind of put four ideas together. It's like that's great. And so then the fall happens. We have you know the Abraham series, and then we had the the series on relationships. About midway through that, I'm kind of like, okay, I need, to, I need to bring some more detail to this series. I start thinking about the different weeks, kind of what we're going to be talking about. And, like, and each one of them is very specific, like it's kind of talking about the death and resurrection of Jesus and kind of how it's foreshadowed in the Old Testament. And so I'm sitting there, like this is like in November, and I'm like, oh my, I've, I've put together an Easter series is Easter series this is Christmas? I've put together an uh, Easter series for Christmas, and so I, I mean, on behalf of me, Mark, and the entire staff, I would like to thank you. I would like to thank you for not noticing, or or not caring. So either way, welcome to to to, to Creaster here at the um, at the Grove at the Grove Church. But reality, really, 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 um, the stories um, ab- about Jesus being born, and they're really cool. I mean, what, uh, what Mary went through and probably the, the social outcasts and dispersions and just insults and things that she had to suffer through being this kind of unwed teenage mom back in the day. I mean, it's, it's powerful. And, and Joseph and the faith to kind of keep her as fiancé and really believe that what she said had happened and trust God and um, the, you know, the, the, the humble way, the humble beginnings of Jesus and shepherds being the first i mean they're all it's all it's all great stories and and their stories are great and they're great to celebrate but and the reason why we get excited about the fact that god sent jesus isn't because his birth stories are so cool i mean we get excited because of the life that he lived and and then what he did for us and so really there is this huge connection because as 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 jesus says himself all throughout the gospels you know i came here i've come to seek and save the lost. I've come here to lay down my life for you. And so the celebration of Christmas is a celebration of the sacrifice and the life that he's given. And so over these last few weeks, have we just been thinking about I me? Mean, is it that this idea that Jesus was going to come has been an idea that has been in the heart and mind of God from the very beginning. We see that with, with Adam and Eve. We see it um, in the the way that God designed the sacrifice systems. We talked about the, those two different goats and kind of how one is a sacrifice and one is a scapegoat. And Jesus references, we talked about this last week, Jesus references, hey, you know, just like Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so I'm going to be lifted up, right? And so the story about one of the ways in which God kind of disciplines and then redeems his people is this beautiful foreshadowing of the coming of Jesus. And so we got one more that we're going to do this week. And again, it's like last week, it's one that Jesus mentions. It's an Old Testament story that he references um, and, and makes the connection to himself. And he's talking to a group of people called the Pharisees. He's talking to a group of people the Pharisees, and just kind of give you some context. These were kind of, the, they were religious and political leaders. They were very, very knowledgeable of the Scriptures. In fact, there were some of them that had the entire Old Testament memorized. And very knowledgeable, but, but what Jesus was doing was kind of turning their worldview upside down. Um, they had begun to believe, really, that what, what God wanted and cared about the most was people who were 
were good and, and, and were perfect, and God loved them, and the way to please God was to be perfect, which they began to believe was possible. And so if God loves perfect people, he hates sinners and people who do the bad stuff. And so there's this... Um, Jesus comes and starts loving on sinners and, and caring for people who are considered in that society the worst of the worst. And, and he's telling them, you think you're perfect, but you're not. And it was, it was, it was just this constant fight. So we're going to see one of those interactions here where he's making all, Jesus is making all these bold claims about who he is and what he does, and they're like, man, what, you keep saying all this. Prove it. And that takes us to Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Then some of the Pharisees and teachers of the law said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. And he answered, A wicked and adulterous generation asks for a sign. We'll just pause here for a second. Um, you may be one of these people who kind of feels like that like, in order for you to do something that God wants you to do or to take some step with God, that you want God to prove it to you, show, you want to give me some sort of sign. I just caution you against that. I really do. It's been very clear from the very beginning. Um, that God is not interested in proving himself to people. Um, and, and neither are you. You don't want anybody, somebody like, prove you love me, prove it. You, know, you don't want that. And because the main thing that God really cares about, I mean, he wants us to respond to him in faith. And so there have been times he responds well to signs and gives somebody a sign, but by large part, it's not, it's not who he is, it's not what he wants. And so he, he's condemning them for demanding the sign. And then says, but none will be given except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of a huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now something greater than Jonah is here. So they're demanding a sign. It's like, man, I'm not going to give you a sign, and, and it shows something about your character that you're demanding one. But let, let me tell you this. There will be one sign. It's going to be the sign of Jonah. And I think for the most part, most people are, have some familiarity with the story of Jonah. I mean, anything that there's a VeggieTales movie about, we probably have some idea about, right? He's the guy that was supposed to go preach and didn't, got ate by the fish, got spit up, and then went to go preach. I think most people at least have some vague familiarity with that story. And... Um, and if you don't, we'll be covering the whole thing. Um, and he says, that's the sign. That's the only sign that you're going to get. And then he tries to explain at least a little bit. He says, you know, just in the same way that, that, that Jonah was in the, in the belly of this fish for three days, so I'm going to be in the earth for three days. And, um, and, and, and so he says, that, that's the sign that you're going to get. And I'm going to be honest with you, I don't know that I've ever really given this this passage a whole lot of thought like what's he really getting at here and because to me i'm a i'm a math guy i was, was a math major and i feel like i'm just everything in my head's numbers like oh man, it's, it's about number three he was in, he was three days in the in the fish three days in the ground i get it it's three that that's it i've never really gone past the number three because why would you, you got a you got a number involved it's great but it's got to be deeper and more than that right it's not like yo i'll give you a sign just like this dude had three drinks for lunch i'm gonna be in the earth for three days i mean it's deeper than that, right? It's more than just three, right? And, 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 and he explains that. And he says, you know, you know, Jonah was in this fish for three days. I'm going to be in the earth for three days. But it doesn't really – is the connection deeper than that? And, of course, the answer is it, it, it would have to be. And he's talking to these people, again, who have the Old Testament memorized for, for a lot of them and would have been incredibly familiar with the story. And there was something or some things about this story that, that Jesus is saying, man, you, you need to kind of reconnect with this story. Because if you, I think if you catch the message of what God's doing there, you'll understand what it is that I'm doing and then ultimately what's going to happen when I die. And so I think if we go back and just kind of dig in a little bit deeper, not only can we understand what happened with Jonah and what that means, but get a greater picture of what it is that Jesus was trying to do and again, one more picture that this idea of sending Jesus to give his life for us was something that has been uh, littered throughout the scripture from the very beginning. So we'll start at the very beginning here of Jonah, chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. <coughs> the word of the Lord 
came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. All right, so Jonah's a prophet, and typically, essentially what that means is, is that God would give him a message. Like, here, Jonah, I've got this message, and I'm going to give it to you, and I want you to take it and give it to these people. And by and large, what that meant was is that these prophets were, were, were Jewish Israelites, right? And, and it would be a, a prophecy for them. Go tell my people. Go to these people and tell them. It was, always, it was pretty much self-contained. And it was very rare, not, it was not, 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 you know, it's not the only time, but it was, it was fairly rare for these prophets to, be, to give messages. Hey, go to this other country and give them this message. But this is what he's asked Jonah to do. I want you to leave Israel. I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to tell them, hey, their sin's a big deal. Their wickedness has gotten to the point to where I just can't take it anymore. You go and tell them, that their wickedness is too much, and I'm really upset with them. You, you go do that. And so, at, at its simplest, what's happening here is our first point, is that Jonah was called to bring God to Nineveh. Hey, you need, you need to go tell them. You need to tell them, from me, their sin is too much. It's too much. And um, I think the first thing that we need to make sure that we get to here is it shows very clearly that God has a heart for the whole world. And sometimes we get a little bit confused about Israel being God's chosen people, that somehow that God had all this favoritism for them and just only cared about them. But it's not true. God's heart was for the whole world. And we see that here, that this was always, it was always, Israel was always meant to kind of be this, this light that kind of drew people and also this kind of launching pad to send people out just like this. You need to go and you need to, you need to tell them, you need to tell them that what they're doing, that they have offended me. You go tell them they don't know, you go tell them. But Jonah didn't want to do it. And there's really lots of good reasons why. And I don't want to, I don't want to overstate this because it may feel overstated to you, but I, I don't really. But to really put this into perspective, he says, go, go tell Nineveh their sins too much. It doesn't necessarily mean anything to you. Just some other, other people, Ninevites, right? But they were a, a, a barbaric people. They were going around, and they, they were wild conquerors. And when they came to your, to your city, I mean, the torture that they would do, the, the tools that they would use for war, they were, they were barbaric and cruel and hated. So imagine it's the 80s, right? And it's like, I want you to go to Moscow and, 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 and talk to them. This might even be, this is definitely one step further, but it's like, it's the 1930s. I want you to go to Berlin and tell them there that their sin is too much. I mean, this is, this is not a small thing that God is asking him to do. I don't like these people. I'm scared of these people. And may I, I may show up at the gate, and I, I, may be, I may be done. There's lots of good reasons to not want to do this. But ultimately, that's not the reason why Jonah doesn't want to go. And we're going to talk about it at the very end, the real reason why he doesn't want to go. But we need to make sure that we understand kind of the context of this. This was not a small thing that God was asking. And so we see God's heart for the whole world, and we also see here God's heart for the worst people. And this is something, again, th this is why I, why I think that, that Jesus is referencing this story to these Pharisees. You think God's all about the best people, the good people, the people who look and play in the part. I'm going to give you the sign of Jonah. And part of that is understanding God's heart for the whole world. Part of that is understanding God's heart to redeem and love and save the worst people. And so he goes, he was like, I want you to go to the worst people. But Jonah doesn't want to do this. He says to, to, to go to Nineveh, which is this way, and he decides he's going to get on a boat going to Tarshish, which is going this way. He thinks he can, he can literally run away from God. So hey, I'm going to get on this boat. I'm going to go the complete opposite direction. And again, to just make it stupidity even worse, now he gets in this boat. He's like, I'm going to hide from God. I'm going to get in the bottom of the boat. I'm going to get in the bottom of the boat, go in the other direction, and then God won't know. He won't see me. And I, I, won't, I won't have to go. And And... and to no surprise to anybody, God wasn't confused. He didn't lose track of him. 
right? He said, oh, he's on, he's on the boat. Oh, he's in the bottom of the boat. What kind of idiot hides in the bottom of a boat? You think I can't see through wood? I mean, I got you right there. I see you, right? And so, so, he, so, he, so he, goes, he goes to the man, and then, and then what God does is he sends this huge storm. And these guys were experienced sailors that were on this boat, right? And so you know, they, they, they see this storm, and they, they immediately, sailors, they get theological. This is a cursed storm. And sometimes we can look back at that and kind of get a little judgmental of them. First of all, they were right. It was a curse storm, so they were right, so we can't be judgmental. And the second is, these were experienced sailors. They would not have left. I mean, I mean they weren't meteorologists with radars or anything, but they, it's like, you can look and be like, there's no storm coming. And then suddenly a storm comes out of nowhere, and I'm sure it, it was of a quality to go from zero to the worst storm they've ever experienced. They got theological, rightly so. Some, this was bad. And so they, somebody's done something. And so they cast lots, which, you know, I essentially just imagine you know, passing out cards, and whoever's got the high card, you're the one that did it, right? And so they pass out the card, they cast lots, right? And then Ace of Spades, Jonah. Like, what'd you do? He's like, well, I'm a prophet, and God told me to do this, but I'm running in the opposite direction. Like, are you kidding me? <laughs> this is what you've done? You've run from God, and now, now we're all here? Verse 11, chapter 1. The sea was getting rougher and rougher. So they asked him, what should we do to you to make the sea calm down for us? In verse 12. Pick me up and throw me into the sea, he replied, and it will become calm. I know that it is my fault that this great storm has come upon you. Then they cried out to the Lord, Please, Lord, do not let us die for taking this man's life. Do not hold us accountable for killing an innocent man. For you, Lord, have done as you pleased. Then they took Jonah and threw him overboard, and the raging sea grew calm. At this the men greatly feared the Lord, and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows to him. <coughs> There's a couple observations here, right? What, what should we do to get this storm to go away? I mean, to me, it feels like the appropriate answer is, I need to repent, and you need to take me back so I can go to Nineveh. But what does Jonah say? You're going to you're gonna have to kill me. Dude, dude wants to die. He does. He mentions it a couple of chapters later. He means that I would rather be dead than doing this thing that you're asking me to do. So he doesn't want to go to Nineveh. I'm going to go the opposite direction. So God brings this judgment. So how are we going to fix the judgment? Well, you're going to have, you're going to, have to kill me. And so he thinks, I, I can hide in the boat. I can hide in the bottom of the boat. I can go the opposite direction. And then eventually you're, going to, you're just going to have to kill me because I ain't going. And God's like, <laughs> guess what? You going. And so he takes a fish, swallows him up. But the reality of it is, even though he didn't die, for all practical purposes, he did. So Jonah was called to bring God to Nineveh, but first, but first, first he died. He died. He sacrificed himself. And there's a couple of things, just even just in the, in the, in the midst of the story, um, of why he, why he died. One is punishment for his own sin. And, and it just, it's just this imagery. It's all throughout the Scripture. We've seen it every week throughout this series. You see it all throughout the Scripture. The penalty, of, the penalty for sin is death. And so there's symbolism there. His, he, he died. But it wasn't just him dying for his own sin. He died at least. I mean, he's got his own issues, right, of, of, of wanting to die. But in part, it's a sacrifice to save other people. And so... We have this prophet who was sent to come and bring the message of God to, the, to this group of people. But first, but first he dies. He dies because of his sin, and he dies to save other people. And so then what happens? He's there in the, in the belly of this fish, and I can just only imagine what those three days were like. I, I, would, I would just, I, I'd imagine it's, it's a range of emotions. I mean, he's, he's got to be frustrated, right? I can't, I, can't even, I can't even die when I want to. I'm trying to kill myself. I can't even die. God, what's wrong with you? I don't want to go. 
how do how do I how do I how do I communicate any clearer? I get in a boat, I hide in the boat, I jump off the I jump off the boat. I don't want to do this. And God's like, I got time. I'm sure all sorts of anger and frustration and fear and all of these things. Days of this. We don't we don't have days of commentary in Jonah. We just kind of get to the conclusion that he comes to. I wouldn't call it incredibly rep, uh, repentant. Um, it was more just kind of uh, uh, re- resigned to it. Fine, you're God, I'm not. Whatever, I'll do it. And that takes us to um, Jonah chapter 2, verse 10. And the Lord commanded the fish, and it vomited Jonah onto dry land. Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. And Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city, and it took three days to go through it. So God's like, hey, now that you're back on the land again, I've got an idea. Why don't you go to Nineveh and tell them the message that I want you to give them? And this time, he says yes. But again, he is still a very reluctant messenger here. He doesn't want to do it. And again, we're going to talk about why here in just a little bit. But he doesn't want to do it, but he does. And so he goes around this large city. It takes three days to kind of just to, to cover all the ground. And he goes to him and he says, hey, guess what? God is really angry at you. Your sin is large. And in a few days, God is going to destroy your city. And in Jonah's message, there's no comma, there's no but, there's no, but if you'll do this, repent. There's no repent. There's no story of repent. This is not, there's no good news here, just bad news. Hey, heads up, uh, God's going to wipe out your city because you're sinners. No, no action item for them except, you know, get your affairs in order, tell your loved ones goodbye. I mean, it's like we're wiping out the city. No, no good news. And, um, and then it says that Jonah goes outside the city uh, to sit and watch what happens. And what happens was, you know, the, the people kind of rally and are like, well, this is not good news. You know, we, we weren't told that, that, that things would be okay, but, what, but maybe, maybe if we repent, maybe if we tell God that we're sorry and, and change our ways, maybe God will forgive us. So even though Jonah didn't give them that message, God got the message to them anyway. And that's exactly what happens. They repent. They repent and and they change their ways and God does not destroy the city. And so in this story, we have Jonah being called, being called to, to bring God to Nineveh. But first he dies. And then uh, he brought life to Nineveh. So now the, the, these people, they have, they have turned, they've repented, they've repented and trusted God. And at least for this generation, at least for this season of this generation anyway, the people of Nineveh decided to put their faith and trust in God. And this goes back to what Jesus said. Hey, listen, man, listen, guys, the people of Nineveh, they're going to judge you. They're going to judge you. Because when they heard the message, they repented. You guys won't. You guys still pretending and playing like you're perfect. And I'm telling you, these people, the worst of the worst of our Old Testament history, these people are going to judge you. You think you're judging sinners. Let me tell you, the worst people in our stories, they're going to judge you because when confronted with their sin, they repented. When confronted with your sin, you pretend you're not sinful. These people, are going to judge you. And then what does he say? The men of Nineveh will stand up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And now, something greater than Jonah is here. So he makes this connection. He says, this is the sign you're going to get. It's Jonah. And what I am is I'm a greater Jonah. Now, some of these times in these weeks, we've been talking about this goat and this goat and the, and the high priest, and, and Moses puts a snake on a pole, and 
At the end, there's kind of this big reveal, right? And this is how it ties in with Jesus. This one's kind of not like that, right? I mean, we're all, we're all tracking with this, right? We're all, we're all together. I mean, I know Christmas is coming and we're a little bit tired and crazy. I mean, God sends somebody to people and then that dude dies and then he comes back from the dead and life comes to the people, right? Jesus, right? This is of Jonah. This is what Jesus did. And so what do we need to do? Believe and receive the greater Jonah. This is what he's telling them. This is what he's telling the Pharisees. They believe, the Ninevites believe Jonah's message. Something much greater than Jonah is here now. Believe this message. It's the same message. And just like in the sign, and it's going to play out just the same. I have come here. I've been sent by God. I'm going to die. I'm going to come back, and I'm going to bring life to the world. Believe in that. So just like Jonah, God saw the most wicked things. He saw people who were, who were self-destructing, who were doing the worst things that you can possibly imagine. And rather than turning away, he said, I'm going to send somebody. He sent Jonah to the Nineveh, and he sent, he, he, he sent Jesus to all of us to give us life, to give us hope. But again, obviously there's differences between Jesus and Jonah. I mean, Jesus did not die for his own sin. Uh, he died voluntarily. But he died because people rejected the thing that he was saying, as opposed to the people, you know, the, the people who, who sacrificed Jonah. They, they kind of did it unwillingly, and God saved them. He was killed because of the message. But he said, just like Jonah... I'm going to be in the heart of the earth for three days. And then I'm coming back. And then, I'm, and, and then life, life is going to be there. Believe that. Make it, make it yours. And we see that, man, at this moment, at the moment of Jesus' death, maybe he had a, a few dozen people who were following him. He comes back to life. And next thing you know, uh, you read through the book of Acts, there's thousands, and then it becomes tens of thousands. And now it's billions of people have given their lives to say that I want to follow and believe this Jesus. And healing and hope and life are coming to people all over the world. And, that, and now, is, now it's your turn to say that I believe this. I've asked God for a sign before. And this is the sign he gave us. I say, he says he's got power over life and death, and he showed it by dying and coming back to life. Believe it, and then receive it and make it personal for you. Now, we're going to end this series kind of the way that we started it. <clears throat> In part, one of the things that we were wanting to accomplish was, there's this idea out there that there's, there's the Old Testament and the New Testament, somehow the, that God's different. And like there's this hard line in between the two of them. The Old Testament God is mean and weird, and the New Testament Jesus is nice, and maybe we should even just ignore this. But really, it's one God, one story all the way through. And sometimes we say this, and you hear people say, man, the God of the Old Testament, he was kind of mean and harsh and judgmental. But you know who would know what the God of the Old Testament was like more than you? more than the people who say this nonsense? Well, Jonah would. I mean, Jonah had some uh, intimate familiarity with who God was during this time. And um, he would get messages from him, pass the messages on to people from God all the time. This was his life. This was his calling. And this is why he said he didn't want to go. And he's pitching a fit. He's pouting. He's upset at God for not destroying Nineveh. He says this to him in chapter 4. He says, Jonah prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? This is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. This is why I didn't want to go. This is why I got on the boat. I knew, I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. I knew this is how you would be. 
I would go there and tell them that you're going to destroy them, and, and then you'd repent, they repent, and then you would forgive them. I didn't want you to forgive them. I wanted you to wipe them out. And I knew that if I went there, you were going to forgive them because that's just how you are. He was upset with God because God's too nice. The guy who knew the Old Testament God way better than you did, way better than you do, he was frustrated with God for being too compassionate and too gracious. This gracious, compassionate God that is offering hope and life to the world, it's the same God. It was true of the Ninevites, and it's true in your life right now. The calamity, the separation, the death that you are experiencing, it's just not what God wants for you. He wants to relent from calamity. He is abounding in love. He is slow to anger. He is gracious, gracious and compassionate and is offering you life now. And whatever it is that's holding you back, I, I just beg you, um, embrace it. And embrace the life that he is offering you through his son. Let that be how you start your Christmas. By giving your life fully to God through Jesus. And for those of us who haven't, who have done that, let this be how we start our Christmas. With deep reflection about what it means that God sent us Jesus. That God has a heart and a love for the whole world. For the worst of the worst. For me. And he came, he died, and he brought us life. So let's reflect on that. As we always do, we have time for worship, kind of personal reflection. Um, the prayer team is back there. They've been praying for you. Um, if you need extra prayer, man, they would love to be praying for you specifically. Communion is available in the back. There's prayer candles. There's a cross where you can pray. There's worship. We have an opportunity to give. Lots of ways for us to respond. But let's take some time and get our hearts, our minds, our souls focused and celebrating on the awesome reason that God sent His Son Jesus to the world. Let's pray. God, I thank you. I thank you that you have not changed. I thank you that we do not have to discard the Old Testament. And God, I thank you that it is full, full of the richness of your character and the foreshadowing of the sending of your son Jesus. God, I thank you that you are gracious and compassionate and slow to anger and relenting of calamity in my life. And God, I pray for all of us here that it would be real to each and every one of us. And God will be where our hearts and minds are these next few days as we celebrate Christmas. We thank you for sending Jesus. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen.